Yo, what's good gamers? What's good? My name is Dr. Ryan Sparrow, Psych Sensei here, and welcome to the clinic, baby. That's right, the clinic is open. I'm sorry, today got kind of crazy with all the things that I was trying to do or produce or shove out, and so I wasn't able to put the graphic up, and you know, honestly, it was kind of hard for me to figure out what I exactly wanted to present today for the clinic, but you know, I was thinking about it, and as I'm getting more into selling my services, I'm finding that people don't really know what psychologists do or can do. And I'm low-key inspired from Robin Williams, the OG GOAT. For the record, Goodwill Hunting is not a typical experience that you have with a, a clinical psychologist. You'd probably lose your license if I did the stuff that Robin Williams did in that movie. But... That's a whole different story. Before we get into all that, I want to welcome you to the show. And if you like me and you want to get to know more about me, you want resources, you want to get more stuff, yo, visit my website, psychsensei.com. There, you can have all the resources. You can have the links to my YouTube that I drop every Friday. I drop a video. And now every Wednesday, I drop a clip. And also, you can get access to my podcast, which I drop every Monday now. And also other things like my Instagram, my TikToks, You'll see more content there. My LinkedIn, all of that information is there on my website, psychsensei.com. But more importantly, if you're interested in working with an esports psychologist or a psychologist for life coaching as a player, coach, whatever, yo, you can also at my website, fill out a free consultation form where you and I can figure out your wooden condition and start working towards it today. I recently updated it. So not only can you put all your information there, but you can also put a day and a time that you can meet. So if that's interesting to you, please visit my website psychsensei.com check out all those resources my youtube's all of it there on my website so if we're just going to jump into it ryan i see you here every day but bro you say a bunch of words and you like type and stuff but i don't actually know what you do or maybe like even what a psychologist does there's a lot of different words let's put all the words here what else have you heard a mental performance coach oh a sports psychologist I got marriage and family therapist. We also got counselor. License is important to throw up there. Mental health providers. How do we start there? Mental health providers. So you got all these people. Psychologist, sports psychologist, but that they're mental performance coach, family therapist. Any other ones that you heard about? Licensed counselor, social worker. There's a lot of providers. Any other one? Oh, I guess a psychiatrist. Maybe it's even important to break down all these different levels of EDU. Okay, that's a whole nother topic. Masters. I don't even know where to put freaking certificate because it's lower than a master's. I think this is where we'll start and then we'll follow the bouncing ball. And then if y'all get lost, I'll revisit it and I'll try to re-explain it because I know that when it comes to mental health and people in the mental health land, it can get kind of confusing because there's so many different titles, there's so many different degrees, there's so many different specialties. And so I think maybe even if I break it down this way and then break it down from level of education and then I can actually talk about what I do in esports. Maybe that would make more sense. With mental health providers, I think where you need to start is the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist. I think these are very important professions, but they're same, same, but different, especially in the United States. So the major difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist is that a psychiatrist is a medical doctor. You know, like when someone on the plane is having like a heart attack and they're like, oh, is there a doctor in the building? This is your captain speaking. If anyone is a doctor in the house, can you please come to the front of the cabin? That's like the medical doctor. I mean, I can go. If there's a doctor in the house, can you please make yourself known? I can make myself known. Hi, I'm a doctor. And when I get to that person, they'll probably be like, yo, man, how you feeling? And they're probably like, I'm feeling really bad. But I'll be like, no, how does that make you feel though? Like that's that's about the most support I could probably give that someone in a medical emergency. Now, if they're having a mental health crisis, maybe that'd be something different, but a like, medical emergency, I am not that kind of doctor, not at all. So a psychologist, it's a clinical degree or like a academic degree. That's a, basically the difference between a PsyD and a PhD is that a PhD basically creates new knowledge. So they're creating new measures, they're running studies, they're writing articles, they're living in academia. Those are PhDs, the professors or whatever. Now that's not meaning I couldn't be a professor, but their training leans itself more into academia. Now that doesn't mean that a PhD can't do clinical work and a PsyD can't do academic work, but again, the emphasis in the their training. 
that's what we're talking about. So a PhD, academics creating new knowledge. You can also equate a PhD for psychology, like a PhD in biology. Both a medical doctor and a PhD in biology know how the body works and runs, but a PhD in biology is not doing surgeries or working with patients. Instead, a PhD in biology is probably doing bio research to create new techniques or whatever to help doctors who are doing the practical work do their work better with their patients. In the same way, a PhD in psychology is creating new measures or information or knowledge that the clinician PsyD can use with their patients or their clients. So me personally, I have a PsyD, so I have a clinician's degree. And so my specialty is in the diagnosis, education, prevention, and uh, but basically working with people to help them get better. That is in my wheelhouse, my training. So major differences, medical doctor, psychiatrist, has understanding of the brain and how it works, the biology of the body, and their main job and function is to provide a diagnosis through their medical lens and provide medical things like drugs. I cannot prescribe drugs. I would have to work with a psychiatrist to send my patient or a client as a referral to them, and then we'd work together with the med management and the behavioral changes, which would be my specialty. Again, that's not saying that psychiatrists don't also do the therapy one-on-one -on -one work. They can, but like I'm saying, their training is more apps to the biology pills and medications and psychotropics and giving you the medications that's going to give you different effects psychologically for depression, anxiety, ADHD, those types of things. That is what psychiatrist does. Me, psychologist, behavioral skills, those types of things. That's what I work on. Marriage and family therapist. This is a master's level degree. And basically the difference between what I do as a PsyD and a marriage and family therapist, we both do therapy and focus on working with clients. However, a marriage and family therapist, they have more limitations what they can do because of their training. And because it's only a master's degree, basically what they can provide or what they specialize is in the therapy. As a clinician, as a PsyD, I can also provide different assessments, intelligence, personality. Those are different things I can do as a PsyD that a marriage and family therapist cannot do. Again, the marriage and family therapist specialty is in the therapy and of families, couples, individuals, and MFTs really focus on systems thinking like my PsyD does too. Now the difference between an MFT, licensed counselor, and social worker, these are all master's degree practitioners or master's degree level practitioners. And the biggest difference between a marriage and family therapist, a licensed counselor, and social work is their training and what they're trained to focus on. A marriage and family therapist really focuses on the system of a family or how the person works and operates within the system of people, relationships, what have you, their job. So it's them in relation to their job, them in relation to their family, them in relation to what have you, because systems, relations, that's what we were trained in. Now, a social worker, although they can also do the therapy piece, what their training and special, special, oh my God, what's the word? Speciality? Specialty. Oh my God. <laughs> it's been a long day. What their specialty is, yes, the therapy, but also hooking up their clients with resources within the community. So think of community-based programs, government assistance, those types of things. They're also trained in finding and leveraging those types of services. I don't have that training. Now, a licensed counselor, they also may focus on the therapy, but what makes them different from a marriage and family therapist is instead of looking at the systems or the person in relation to the systems, they just look at a person in isolation by themselves. And so, yeah, it, it works. But I think the, I think marriage and family therapists are, might be a little bit more geared to what I'm used to as you're looking at the system. Again, system, individual, system as a whole, resources, I think this is the way to break it down with the levels of education. In esports, what you'll hear about is a mental performance coach, you'll hear about mental performance trainers, you'll have a sports psychologist, you might even have myself as an esports psychologist. I've also heard of industrial organizational psychologists being in esports. Basically what we're doing, psychologists or in esports, is we're bringing our skills that we've learned from our different disciplines or different trainings and applying our knowledge and bending it towards esports. Now, I was, did some research into mental performance coaches or what have you, and even though people with higher level education degrees will call themselves mental performance coaches or trainers, if someone is just a mental performance coach or trainer, they may have a certificate from somewhere. <laughs> I don't I don't know that certifies them under the trainings of being a mental performance coach but to my knowledge you don't need any higher 
order level education to become a mental performance coach, maybe a bachelor's degree or an AA degree, but I'm not quite sure what that certification process is or the techniques that they use. So buyer beware. I'm not saying that mental performance coaches aren't useful. That's not what I'm saying or that they're bad. I just don't know the level or quality of their training or techniques that they use. Now, a sports psychologist can either be a master's level or a doctorate level practitioner or degree. And basically what sports psychologists focus on is the performance piece and really helping players, traditional sport athletes, be able to perform or manage mentally their thoughts or emotions to help them put on their best performance in the moment. I think that's the, the best way to describe it. And I think where me as an esports psychologist and where a sports psychologist may differ, where as an esports psychologist, my goal and my angle has always been trying to help a player more holistically through their habits, behaviors, routines, mindsets, whatever, and helping them actually learn the game to be more consistent in performance. I think a sports psychologist would focus mainly on the performance itself. And so I take a more holistic approach as an esports psychologist and where people might get confused or whatever is they ask me like, okay, like as a psychologist, now that I've ran through all this, what does an esports psychologist do? What can you do? That's a very big question because there's a lot of things I can do and there's a lot of things I, I would like to do, but it depends on my client or whoever I'm working with. And so as an esports psychologist, I've worked with individual players and with individual players, I help them create better systems or structures around their learning. I help them with different issues like tilt, understanding their emotions, expressing their emotions, communicating with their teammates or coaches, getting out of their own way because they're holding things inside and they don't know how to express themselves to the team teammates or their needs or whatever. I've also helped make training plans or sleep schedules or sleep routines, training routines, whatever players need to improve their game or whatever they want to work on. And I think this is a, a good side note to talk about. I don't do things to my players or coaches. I do things with them. I, I was watching another really interesting documentary, a part of it. It's called Stoltz or Schultz or whatever. It's uh, Jonah Hill's therapist on Netflix. And what I thought was really interesting through that dynamic between those two people was the emphasis of, oh, you go to a psychologist and you want advice, but they just listen. And when you talk to your friends, you just want them to listen, but they give you advice. And so I think the misconception about working with a psychologist is you're going to go to a psychologist and they're going to tell you how to live your life. And off the bat, that's, that's not what good psychologists do. I'm not saying that psychologists don't do that because some do, but what I'm saying is I'm here to provide you with different opportunities to observe your perspective, have some reflections and help you choose what you want to do instead of maybe doing things that may be counterintuitive to the things that you want to be doing. So I'll ask questions. I'll provide you with summaries. I'll reflect on what you're saying. I'll provide you with, hey, I think you're saying this. Is that clear? You say this and this it doesn't make any sense. Can you help me understand how these two things can exist? My job is not to provide you with advice. My job is to help guide you through your own thinking process because my goal ultimately as a psychologist is to work myself out of a job. Yes, that's right. My job is to work myself out of a job, meaning that I want to help teach my clients, my players, my coaches, my teams ways, techniques, skills where they can actually increase their awareness to what's happening, their states of being, what they're thinking, what they're doing, and allow them opportunities to choose and do things differently the way that they want to do it to help them live their best life. So yes, Sometimes people think that I'm going to tell them what to do, but instead I help guide them into finding what they want to do and, and strategizing how to do that consistently for them. That's my job as a psychologist. And so during my sessions with a player, it's very player or client led. And what I mean by that is I'll ask a player or a client, like, what do you want to do? What do you want to work on? How would you know after working with me that everything was better or that you got improvement? And from there, I let my client, the person in front of me, guide the session because I don't want to make my client or player or something do something that they didn't want to do or that they weren't interested in. And so even more, it's better if, hey, you drive. Where do you want to go? What do you want to think about? What do you want to improve today? What do you want to work on? Those are how I really guide my sessions. And I think the hardest part is when players like I don't know you go wherever you want man and it's kind of like ah uh, no this is maybe the first area that we need to work on is I need to help give you the agency or feel like you have the power to choose 
wherever you want to go. Because I was actually working with a client and I asked him, hey, what is your relationship with conflict? Tell me about it. And they're like, what do you mean conflict? I was like, you know, like when you get into tussles or when you get into arguments with people or whatever with people, what is it like? He's like, bro, listen, I don't get into conflicts, man. I'm like too chill, man. I'm like, whatever. And so I was like, huh, okay. Are you too chill and you don't have any conflict or are you conflict averse? And he was like, I think it's more of the second one because there's a big difference between being chill and being conflict averse. And so even in those moments, it's very important that people have opinions, people have a direction, people know what they want to do or want to get better at. And that's my job is to sit with you and either take you where you want to go after you tell me or help you figure that out. In a sense, you can think of me as a psychologist or an esports psychologist as a GPS where a GPS itself does not have a pre-programmed destination that it wants to go to. It's got maps, it's got traffic alerts or knows where the traffic is, it's got rush hour times, it's got whatever data that Google or Garmin or whatever those GPSs tracks. Like that's all the information it has. But a GPS is completely useless unless you type in the destination that you want to go into. And so you tell me where to go. You're my boss. <laughs> the money that you pay me is an investment into yourself, but you're my boss. You pay me to figure out how to overcome obstacles or challenges get in your way as you continue your journey of life or improvement of games or whatever. And so after you give me a destination, I'll provide you with, you want to go to Target. Here are some ways to go to Target. Do you want to go to Target by a bus? Do you want to go to Target by car, by walking, by a mix of all three? How do you want to get there? It's a choose your own adventure. And you're like, eh, you know, I feel like going by feet. Okay, I'm going to walk. Okay, cool. Once you pick where you want to go, how you want to get there, how long you want to take to get there, we start the journey. And the funnest part about the journey is I get to follow my clients. I get to follow my clients, my players, my coaches, get to join them in their endeavors or where they want to go. But here's the thing. Whenever I provide my client with a homework assignment or some things to do outside of session to continue our work, if, for example, they say, Ryan, listen, man, I know we're talking about tilt and I know that this is my plan for tilt, but bro, I, I keep tilting or I slipped into my bad habits, did the thing that I knew I wasn't supposed to do. What do you think my reaction to my players or my coaches when they say that they're trying to work on these things, but they slipped or they didn't do the thing or didn't do the homework? Do I yell at them? Do I berate them? Do I say, oh my God, that's so terrible. How come you didn't do that? Or how come you did that? You know, they're so dumb. No, just like your GPS. I'm not here to tell you, oh my God, you're such a dumb piece of shit. You're supposed to take a right turn back there, but it's like three miles. And what are you doing? We can't even turn around now. You're going to be five hours late to your thing because traffic, you dumb, dumb. No, it doesn't tell you that. All it tells you is recalculating. We may say all those things to ourselves instead. That's a whole nother topic. But my job is just to say, oh, recalculating. Here's a new route. Here's a new plan. Here's a new way to, you know, get to your destination. It may take a little bit longer, but pff, whatever. It doesn't matter as long as you get there recalculating. That's my job. Those are like the two biggest misconceptions is that I, as an esports psychologist, is going to tell you how to live your life or what you should be doing or berate you when things go wrong. But my job is just to ask questions and to help facilitate your growth and the growth process of my players. And that's it. And with coaches, coaches think, oh, you're gonna tell me how to be the best coach. What are the things that I'm going to need to do to be able to coach really well? And for both coaches or players, whatever, I do have a structure for them. I do have best practices, or I know for sure are gonna get you better outcomes if you do these things or think like this, try to do this thing differently. But at the same time, if a player says, Ryan, listen, man, I know you talk about sleep. I know you talk about being consistent in these habits and behaviors, but listen, man, what else do you got? Cause I'm not gonna change my sleep behaviors. Then I say, okay, that's your choice. And if you understand the risk and benefits of that choice, these are some things that we can do to maximize the times that you don't sleep or get the most performance that you can get from what you're currently doing. But you understand that there's more effective ways to do things. Yes. Okay. I think that's maybe the biggest point that I think my goal of working with my players is, is if I was going to put a tagline on it, my number one goal when working with players or coaches, whoever is to raise their level of awareness and intentionality in not only what they're doing and what they're thinking, but whatever they're doing, all of it. There's a lot of parallels in my work as an esports psychologist that I talk to my players with. And so we can use games to improve their life and we use life to improve their games. And so if I can help my players be more intentional, and aware of what they're doing in game, 
we can also cross that and doing things that they're doing in life because sometimes if they're a tilter they might be tilting in life or if they're bad at emotion regulating they might be bad at emotion regulating in real life if i can help my players increase their awareness increase their intentionality in life and games that's a success in my books. And where I start with coaches is making sure, one, understand their own systems that they wanna create in either how they wanna to relate to their players, how they want practices to go, the things that they think are really important, how are they teaching their players or providing them corrections or feedback to what they wanna do, how are they in relationship with their players. The biggest thing even with a coach is how are they in relationship with themselves? Because I think a coach's job is so much different than a player's, they're often maybe a little bit older they have different life experiences than their players they're not playing the game so they have full vision of pure strategies and their players tendencies and habits and now they're trying to play 3d chess and making their players do things that they may not understand they may not believe in or they just think is bad because they're just playing the game even with coaches there's a different type of growth that they have to do because sometimes they have to really balance the relationship that they have with their players because sometimes they're not much older sometimes they're their peers what's interesting about a coach is that they have to really walk this fine line between authoritarian teacher mentor coach confidant there's a very interesting line that coaches need to walk and navigate and many times I, I find coaches talking to me about their own insecurities about navigating that relationship where most of the time they are working on balancing that relationship and some coaches do it better than others some coaches are more oblivious than others about this relationship and so it's even working with a coach to see what type of relationship they want to have with their players or what types of things they want to learn to better themselves and what's really interesting about coaches if coaches are insecure in themselves insecure in what they think or what they believe that could lead to very big problems within the team it's even more important for coaches to come work with a psychologist or someone that can help them provide a non-judgmental objective perspective of what they might be doing what might be getting in their way and how they could do things differently because the biggest thing with a coach is that they're not only working and managing themselves but now they're working and managing people who are younger than them who see them as a leader who see them as xyz who have expectations of them but at the same time if a coach is unable to recognize the standards or things that they also need to hold themselves to then it could get very very messy Working with entire teams, I'd say, is my favorite part of the gig. And why I would say working with entire teams is so fun is because when you work with an entire team, you get to see how everything interacts. With personalities and people, there's always a push-pull in what they want, how they communicate, how they see things from their perspective. In my role and functions of working with a team, one, it's working on communications, relationships, conflicts, strengthening things or massaging of these things. It's so fun to work in these different teams because what I really, really love is watching teams grow and develop and become closer with each other. It's really fun to see a team who is entering this honeymoon stage and everything is great and everything is amazing and we're winning and it's fun. And then the first conflict happens. People forget that when things go wrong, people are bringing in all their previous experiences of working with teams, their friends, their coaches, and now they're applying them to the situation. And sometimes when they apply those previous experiences or things it's it makes sense this is a good place to apply this thought or this way of being but it's funny because we can sidestep into life and think about romantic relationships or baggage or whatever that people may bring into their partner relationships from their own past or hurts or dramas or whatever it's the same thing in teams a really common problem that i see is that we hold all those things inside well one we hold them inside because if everything is great i don't want to share with you something that's bothering me and rocking the boat because there wasn't a conflict but if i tell you that, that there's a conflict now there's a problem or maybe i'll hold these things inside because you should know like you should see how i'm responding to you or you should see how I'm not responding to you and you should just know that I'm upset with you but my experience especially with 
boys, with guys, with men on these teams that I work with, it's teaching them how to express their thoughts, their emotions, their values to others in a way that feels comfortable for them. It doesn't feel weird in a way that makes sense to them, in a way that others can hear them. And by having this discussion, it's funny because we always make up these stories in our heads about how people are going to react or whether they're going to think about me or they're going to think less of me or they are see me as weak. And then we have this conversation within the team and then they're like, oh, yeah, man, I'm so glad that you told me. I, I didn't I didn't even know that was bothering you or bro, I didn't know that was bothering you so much. I'm so sorry. Let me know. And another common thing I hear about teams is, bro, I told this person like twice already. I told them and they should just remember, right? Or even coaches say that I told them once, twice, three times and they should remember, right? Let's be real. Think of how many times you need to be reminded of the thing or you need to be told about the thing to actually remember it or like not remember it, but consistently perform it. It's going to take a couple of times. It's going to take multiple times. It's going to take multiple reminders. And I think maybe there's a thought of, oh, if this person really valued me or really appreciated me, then they would remember sometimes. But at the same time, it's funny how we forget how wrapped up in other stuff people are. But at the same time, we always think that they're thinking about us. <laughs> I think it's really funny that uh, speaking out loud, how we expect people to remember first or second time we tell them to do something. At the same time, we don't want to remind that person because we don't want to be irritating or naggy. But at the same time, we also get mad maybe at the same person for not noticing the thing that we're thinking about because we didn't tell them. But everybody knows what I'm thinking. It's a whole thing. When working with teams, it's really helping the team grow together by helping them through different conversations, activities, points of interest about how they best work together, how they interact together, how things they might be saying or doing or thinking might be getting in their way of them playing better together and then teaching them how to support each other in times of need or high stress. So that's a lot already and I think something else that people don't realize or don't understand about psychologists in general is that if we're working i'm always paying attention i'm always listening i'm always thinking about something i'm putting it together and my goal or my job is to use my observational skills to help present this information because i'm just learning about my clients or my teams or my coaches 24 7. I'm not being creepy about it. Like, okay, you know when you like go to a psychologist or like you first meet one, like, oh my God, are you thinking about what I'm thinking? Are you reading my mind? It's like, first of all, I don't have that power. Second of all, you don't pay me enough for that. Third of all, do you work when you don't have to work? No, that's not how this works. And by the way, I already did and I could diagnose you with 10 things. <laughs> just jokes. These are just jokes. I think that's something that people don't realize is that as a psychologist, I'm just a trained observer and every session or every interaction that I have with my players or coaches or teams, like I'm constantly learning. I'm constantly thinking about why they're doing these things or how this connects to something else or how this person connects to this person or what may be getting in the way of this person's from getting to or like whatever they want to be doing. And so I think that's something important to, to understand is that typically, behind every question, behind every thought reflection we provide you, there's a thought behind it. And anytime I my players or coaches ask me like, where did you get this from? Or like, how are you putting this together? I'm like, oh, this is this is like how I put it all together. You said this, and then I tracked it here. And then I thought about this. And then I was wondering about this. And then that's why I asked you this. But I'm trying to figure out or understand if you do this, this or that or think this. And so at any time, if you want to ask your psychologist like what you're thinking or how you got there, or whatever, or sometimes I even take notes. I tell my client like, hey, if you ever wanna see my notes, just let me know and I can show you because this is just for me. But if you wanna understand what I'm writing down, I don't have, I have nothing to hide here. Maybe this is my selfless plug. If you're interested in working with an esports psychologist now that you have a little more understanding about what a session might look like or what we might do in a session, Fill out my free consultation form on my website, psychsensei.com, and you and I can sit down, meet each other, and the whole purpose of this consultation and why I want to emphasize the purpose of it is there have been tons, literally, of research studies about what's the most effective modality, what's the most effective thing in the room when working with a psychologist, mental health provider. And in 
consistently across the board, independent of the modality or the education or the training that you have for mental health providers, again, again, and again, the number one thing that has come up to increase the outcomes of their clients, to increase the success of therapy, to increase the whatever, it always helps, is number one, the relationship you have with your therapist, coach, whatever. That is the number one factor to predict the prognosis or how therapy is going to go or how coaching is going to go is your relationship with your therapist. And so in the first session, what I'm trying to understand or what I'm trying to, to do with the person is one, see what they want to work on. Two, I'm really trying to understand, hey, do you like me? <laughs> <laughs> do you like me? Can we vibe for an hour every week? Do you see me as someone that you can trust, that you can take risks with in telling me some things that you're afraid of or that you want to work on or that you're scared of saying out loud? That's the first and foremost thing is, do you trust me? Can you work with me? Do you like me? Can we vibe? And what do you want to work on? And then after that, the next session, what I do is I do an intake. And basically what that intake is, it's an hour to an hour and a half. And I run through a, a bunch of different questions just to understand you, what you want to do, history and gaming, all of it. Because the more that I know about you or the more that I know how you think, your perspectives, the more that I can give you tools, skills, and techniques, especially to you. And then after that, we meet on a one-on-one -on -one basis for 10 weeks is the stent that I like to work in. You can do a lot of work in 10 weeks. So in that 10 weeks, each session, I'll ask my client, what do you want to work on? Review some homework that maybe I gave them last session working on your goals or wherever you want to go. And then after that, another set of homeworks or things to think about after the coaching session to continue your work outside. That's where most of the work happens is you trying the skills on your own. Now, the process works very similar for players and coaches. Just the focus on what we do and what we talk about will, of course, be different because coaches want to talk about coaching things and players often want to talk about playing things and whatever my client want to work on, that's what we talk about. If you've never really worked with a coach before, I encourage you, yo, fill out that consultation form on my website and you can see what it's like. We can vibe, we can talk and see. And if you need other resources, I am always open and willing to provide whatever resources I can within that first session. Sometimes it's a referral to a psychologist. Sometimes it's a referral to a psychiatrist. Sometimes it's a referral to different types of coaching or in-game coaching or whatever. I'm here to help. I, I like to be the connector to help find what people need need. And I hope this was informative about the different types of mental health providers in esports, what the difference between an esports psychologist, regular psychologist is, and how I work with my players or coaches or teams in general. And if you're interested, you can reach out to me or we can talk. Or if you have more questions, you can fill out that thing on my website and I can provide you with more resources or contacts or information to help guide yourself through this process. If you want to find a coach or a therapist or an esports psychologist, psychologist or somebody to help you in life or in game. Well, maybe a shorter stream tonight. Sorry that I was a little bit late for the stream because I was uploading videos. I'm super stoked. So if you want to catch some more of my content, yo, this Friday, tomorrow, I will be dropping another YouTube video. And also catch me at 9 a.m. PST for Coffee with Casey. And we'll be covering nutrition, esports, psychology, all of it. Probably going down some rabbit holes because it's always a fun time talking with Casey and probably nerd out on something. We'll find it. Come if you want to learn how to increase your performance in esports or in life. I learned that seven cups of coffee is good for health, but performance... Shrug! I don't know. We'll figure it out. But always great to catch up with Casey and talk about nerdy stuff. So come nerd out with us at 9 a.m. PSD tomorrow. And also catch my YouTube drop and uh, all those kinds of things. And if you want to find that, you can find me on my YouTube channel, which is on my website, psychsensei.com. And also, if you never want to miss a crazy thought or announcement of mine, uh, follow me on the Twitters at the Psych Sensei. Find out when I drop everything and never miss a beat. Or you can just join my Discord server and you can find all my stuff there too. That's it for me. Thanks for coming to join me at the clinic just to give you a little bit more information about someone who works here at the clinic or the only 
person who works here at the clinic. Hopefully you understand a little bit more about mental health providers, the differences, and how I can help you as an esports psychologist, or if you're a player or a coach, how I can help you get to where you want to go. All right, friends, thanks for coming. I'll be back tomorrow, 9 a.m. with Coffee with Casey. And as always, yo, my name is Dr. Ryan Terrell, your psych sensei, teaching you to think, play, and slay one day, one question, one thought at a time. And remember, friends, I'm always here to remind you that stronger mental wins. All right, friends, you take it easy. Have a nice night. Love ya. Mwah. Bye. See you next time. See you tomorrow. 9 a.m. PSD. Coffee with Casey.